So welcome to the day number four or the fragmentation training school of biomage analysis. Today we have the pleasure uh, to have uh, Robert Aze from uh, University of Dresden. He will talk about a parallelization and a GPU accelerated uh, image processing. We have the pleasure to have with us um, uh, the Galaxy team from University of Freiburg with uh, Beatrice Serrano Solano and Bjorn Gröning. And they will give us an introduction to Galaxy workflow environment. The second part of the training school will be the work on your own data session. And the participant will be divided into groups. They will work on the project that they have selected. And they will be helped by Anna Sojilkovic from Shivis, uh, Benjamin Pavi from uh, Vib Bioimaging Core, and Finn Bacal from University of Manchester. Uh, thank you for joining. And I ask uh, Robert if he wants to start to share the screen. Uh, thank you, Rocco, for the introduction. And also thank you and the organizers for having me. I will talk about parallelization in heterogeneous computing from pure CPU to GPU accelerated image processing. Um, some of the first slides um, may be known already, um, just to get us all on the same page. So when we were working with ImageJ, for example, to work with these three-dimensional plus time image data of developing embryos, for example, we typically um, get one time point out to do some processing with it, and we apply background subtraction to visualize the nuclear abductor. And it takes some time. <laughs> um, and it's like how we were working with ImageJ for a long, long time. Then at some point, we see the background subtracted image, then we do a maximum projection. So it really takes some time until you first see your entire data set, the developing embryo, for example. So for me, back in the days when I was a postdoc in Myers lab, um, this was like, I was spending a lot of time sitting in front of my computer watching ImageJ's uh, status bar. And that's why I basically took over a project uh, from Louis Groyer, who was working on OpenCL. And we were developing these kind of kernel functions. This is an OpenCL kernel for doing a maximum projection. But it's not like that you can accelerate image processing by learning a new, new programming language like, such as OpenCL or CUDA. It would be wasting a lot of time. And that's why um, I wrapped it all into user-friendly Napari plugins. Uh, Napari plugins, ha, Fitchy plugins. Um, you see here already the CLIJ assistant, where you can basically do the same operations, but you see it instantly. And you can also process time-lapse data right uh, immediately getting feedback if you have a powerful graphics card, which helps you for that. Um, then in the years after, I also switched a bit, I must say, to the Python ecosystem. And I'm now using more and more Napari for my data analysis and also introduce um, collaborators here to Python programming and um, Napari for image processing. And uh, it is pretty much we are trying to get the same user convenience like with the image chain macro recorder also to this ecosystem um, so that we can basically have code representing our image analysis workflow. So then, for example, deploy this code to the cloud. And this is what I will go through today, um, just um, showing you a bit um, where this project comes from. So the first one of the first challenges in, along this road is um, workflow management. So you have just seen some workflows and I was clicking and uh, was basically building up those workflows. But what do I mean with management and why do we actually have to think of order of commands, for example, what to do? But just as an example workflow, we see here um, a Drosophila embryo. This time also a 3D light sheet data set, something like one or 200 megabytes large per time point. I do some background subtraction, the pre-processing, then I do a transformation. I basically unwrap this uh, embryo where the cells live on an ellipsoidal surface, more or less. And I do some segmentation and I visualize the segmentation and I want to save the result, just as an example workflow. And this is basically uh, here visualized in a different way from the top to the bottom. If I want to, for example, do a Gaussian blur filter, it takes so long. So you see here, this is a time axis and it takes so long to apply a Gaussian blur. If I do a Gaussian blur on a graphics processing unit, uh, on a graphics card, it's faster, but I have to push my data there and I have to pull the result back. So this also costs time. So in total, if you think about it, uh, going from here to here is actually taking longer, even though we use a fast graphics card, but it takes longer to process the data because we just process a single uh, processing step there and we have this push-pull additional uh, time lost. Basically, so the, the idea of workflow management is 
you put multiple operations together, everything you can do on a GPU, you do in a GPU um, basically in one shot. And then actually the push and pull makes sense because all together you finish this workflow earlier as if you would do the same thing on a CPU. So this is basically what I'm talking about. So this is about time. And there's also, especially if you think about big data, there's also a data problem we have to think about when we organize our workflows. Assume we have this again workflow where we load data and the image J way of doing it would be pretty much that. So you load the entire time-lapse data set. And then when you want to do pre-processing, there is this window popping up asking you if you want to process all 8 billion data sets, time points, slices, whatever in one shot. And back in the days, ImageJ, we were clicking here on yes and waiting for some time, but we are also, when you see what modern microscopes, what data they produce, this is kind of, it's like now rendering projects impossible. We cannot click on yes here anymore because it would take ages to do that. And furthermore, we may not even have the memory to store all the intermediate results. So a better strategy for doing that is basically loading the data of a first time point, processing this one, and then saving the result, and then loading the next time, processing this one and saving the result and organizing our workflows like that. So compared to the slide before we go, basically from a vertical approach to a horizontal approach, we really have to do that when we deal with big data. Um, so this strategy works nicely, for example, for processing time points of a long time lapse of a developing embryo, um, but it also works when you think about large 3D data and you want to process it tile by tile. But again, we have to rethink our workflows in a way that our scripts or whatever we program uh, implement this new strategy. Um, when we do that, so this is now the video from the paper, from the CLIJ paper we published two years ago. Um, when we do that, we can quite easily um, on a laptop, for example, speed up workflows. Um, and uh, can easily, for example, achieve something like a speed up of a uh, factor of 15 on a, on a random Intel laptop, or if you go to a, a fancy workstation with a proper graphics card in there, we can have speed up factors of about 30. So you do things 30 times faster um, than if you would do it with classical image J. So, so there's, there's a lot to win, right? But um, and you also see here again a bit more in detail um, plots we did back in the days when we published that. And there's also here on the bottom a link to the YouTube video where I explained it in more detail. Generally, you can just say that orange and red are the curves of the processing time um, of graphics cards and green and blue are the CPUs in the computers we tested. So in general, in the very most cases, um, GPUs are outperforming CPUs naturally because they have faster memory access. Um, but you can also go some steps forward from this strategy. So you can, for example, implement a scheme like that that you basically dynamically dependent on if you can load data at the moment, if the hard drive is busy, if the network cable is busy, if the memory is busy, you can also process data like this. Um, and therefore you really need advanced programming skills yet. So there's like, I think I know 10 groups who are working on this. Um, so I'm looking forward to see this in the hand of biologists at some point, I'm absolutely sure that it will happen. Um, so this is basically workflow management. We have to rethink a bit about in which order we do things in order to spare memory, in order to spare time. And then there's another challenge in a similar context. It's about tiled image processing. So I always typically say that tiling is the last parameter against big data. If you can downscale your data set, if you can crop the area where the sample sits to make your uh, data set smaller and then only process the cropped and downsampled area, um, or volume, that's the better strategy. Only if these things are not possible, you have to go for tiling at some point. And tiling means the following. I have, for example, this not exactly biological example, but I have this example image and I want to apply a Gaussian blur to it. So it would theoretically, it would look like this. Um, unfortunately, this image does not fit in computer memories. Yeah, theoretically, let's think about that. So I have to tile it into many small pieces and process these small pieces, these tiles or blocks independently. Um, and if I do that, if I apply a Gaussian blur to these small blocks, then my example image would then look like that. So this is basically just cutting it into tiles, processing it as before, and then putting the tiles together again, that you get this kind of tiling artifact. Um, and in order to prevent that, 
um, there's a strategy. The strategy is to put margins around. So you do not just process the tile, but you also process some additional pixels around. And depending on how large you make this margin, you get then again the correct or at least an approximately correct result out. But the tiling strategy has obviously the disadvantage um, that you have to have, have to have to take additional pixels into account. And therefore, when you look, for example, at this tile, 32 times 32 pixels, um, and the examples from the slide before, additional 10 pixels, additional 20 pixels around, means that processing this tile with 20 pixels margin is approximately five times as large as the tile itself. So we lose a processing time of factor five by tiling, right? Again, possibly tiled image processing is the only way of processing the data, but we lose a factor of five in processing time. So maybe GPU acceleration makes sense to get this kind of loss in processing time back. Um, yeah, and again, yeah, computation time depends on tile size and margin size. And furthermore, there are some algorithmically challenges related to tiles. So let's assume we have this binary image and we want to do connected component labeling to that. So we want to label all these individual objects with a different number, object one, object two, object three. And if we basically do that in tiles, our result may look like that. So that we see at the tile borders that objects are basically not assembled correctly. Also here margins can help, um, but it's actually a bit more tricky because you cannot just assemble these objects together. You have to know when here the objects one to 15 are labeled, then in the next tile you have to start counting at 16 and then maybe going until 30. Um, so this is like a, a bit more challenging, let's say, but um, it is technically feasible. So that's like there is algorithms for that. And if you now come with a more challenging data set like the spirals again, or in more biological terms, think of um, think of neurons or think of vessels in uh, in, a, in an animal, for example, that could be similarly elongated objects over multiple tiles in a large 3D image. Um, if you then tile, if you then apply connected component labeling, should look like that. And if you then uh, apply tiling and connected component labeling, you may get a result like this because the same object, which is here in tile number four on the bottom right, and um, the object in the top left, it's the same thing. They are connected, right? So they should all get the same number. But in order to do that correctly, you have to effectively visit all tiles. So again, there's algorithms for this. This is like people wrote their PhD thesis about it maybe 20 years ago, so technically solved. But I'm not aware of any software where you can just do that. And if somebody here in the audience knows better than me, please let me know. <laughs> I'm not aware of any software where you can do these kind of things um, on big data. Um, okay, so then there's one more challenge, which is, yeah, I don't think it's only interesting for me, but it's something that's very interesting for me um, and the research we do here in Western. Um, image data science in the context of cells and tissues. So if you think about image processing, we apply filters to pixels and we consider neighboring pixels um, of, for example, the center pixel here into account and there are different neighbor neighborhoods, neighborhood relationships. Um, for example, the pixels which are sharing an edge are in green and the pixels which lie in a certain radius are shown in magenta. And if you think about tissues and cells, um, the, pretty much the same neighborhood relationships can be formulated. So you can also here say cells which are sharing a membrane or in the segmented case, which are sharing an edge or cells where the centroid distance is within a given radius. So you can pretty much imagine that it's the same, just it's less, tissue, tissues are typically less structured. Um, so, but um, yeah, so there's like, let's look at a practical example. So we see here an, an intensity image, maybe 40 times 40 pixels approximately. Um, we do some thresholding, then after thresholding, we do some erosion, we do some dilation, and we get a segmentation result out. This is like image processing 101. If we now take a label image of cells here in the bottom corner and a corresponding parametric image, for example, a gene expression of these cells or elongation of these cells or any physical parameter we measured from that expressed in an image. So this is no longer a kind of a pixel image. It's of course still a pixel image, but we see it as a different image, as a parametric image and a label image pair. We can also threshold these cells. We can say, I would like to have all cells with an expression above a certain value and then get this binary cell image out. 
um, we can also apply erosion and dilation here. So pretty much the same operations can also be formulated for images of, of images showing segmented cells as if we were working with pixels which have not a, a rectangular shape anymore. And uh, these kind of things are, for example, available in Fiji, also in Napari. And then you can do some additional advanced measurements. Like, for example, I would like to measure the mean centroid distance between closest neighbors. I want to investigate how dense cells are to each other. And I would like to have the average for each cell. So I would like to take the neighborhood relationship of these cells into account and measure the average of those. These are operations which are also published 10, 20 years approximately. You find that here and there in publications, but you typically do not find that in software and you cannot just apply that to image data. So that's why we are working on making these things available in ImageJ, but also in Python. And here you see again the example in Napari. Um, why are we doing this? Um, think about you have this um, image of this uh, tri-volume embryo developing. You have a segmentation or an approximation of cells. Um, then you measure, for example, the distance to the nearest neighbors. You can also measure the local standard deviation of the distance to the nearest neighbors. And then you can classify this image, or you can even use unsupervised machine learning, for example, k-means clustering, um, to subdivide this entire embryo into multiple different regions. Um, for example, the rosa and forming head or tail or these kind of things. Um, so this is like, this is nice, you can do that, but you can also put additional intermediate processing steps here. And that's what I basically am explaining on the slides before. Um, you can also say, okay, I would like to have the local average distance of the nearest neighbors and then the standard deviation of the local average distance of the nearest neighbors. And then you get a cleaner clustering result out. So what we were doing when we used, for example, things like elastic or um, VK trainable segmentation, we specify filters for processing the pixel image. And here we pro here basically we specify filters for, pro for processing the segmented um, image showing um, cells or nuclei. It's basically the same technology, just on a higher level working with cells and no longer with pixels. And then comes the actual interesting challenge, at least for the talk today. How can I deploy that to the cloud? So after I have defined my image analysis workflow, how can I make this run uh, on high performance computing? For example, here ZIH is our local compute center um, or in Google Colab. So again, there's nice Napari plugins we are working on for formulating these workflows. Um, and you should also basically um, load a data set where there are multiple time points um, and you can go a bit through time. And Bjorn, if you can turn your microphone off, that would be super cool. <laughs> Hi, Bjorn, by the way. <laughs> um, so you should also um, go a bit through a time lapse and see if these parameters you have been defining for your workflow, um, you should go a bit back and forth in time to see if the parameters work on multiple time points on your time lapse, or you load multiple data sets and you look at if the parameters work there. Um, you can also, if you have some ground truth annotation, um, you can also optimize parameters of workflows to get some kind of an, uh, a good parameter setting of the specific workflow for processing your data. So here I'm segmenting some cells, I'm tuning a bit um, the parameters, I do that in two steps, and then I get a, to my um, manual annotation, good fitting result, a result workflow, basically result producing workflow out. Um, and here I show it again on a different data set. It's a zebrafish um, I. I would like to segment the nuclei, I tune a bit the parameters, and then at some point I can export code. So here in this case, I'm exp exporting a Jupyter notebook. And then from this Jupyter notebook, I can execute this workflow again and look in Napari if the result is still the same. So I basically go like in Napari, click, 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 and then I generate a Jupyter notebook, which produces the same workflow. That's the, let's say, bare minimum documentation of my workflow before I can submit it to the cloud. So you should first look um, if like the steps are really reproducible, really doing the same on the same data set. Um, I think here I'm showing it again with a little bit more advanced stuff. Um, you can also um, read the notebook I'm showing here. You can also download it's linked on the bottom of that slide. Um, so you can also do additional things, for example, changing how things in Apari are visualized. You can set lookup tables and these kind of things, um, which might be useful if you want to better document the workflow in an, in an advanced way. Yeah? So changing lookup tables, doing segmentation, these kind of things.
as maybe I'm speaking too fast for this video. <laughs> Yeah, Gossen Blur. Um, afterwards, that should oh, also. <laughs> Rocco, what did you say? Okay. I think it's okay. At least um, I think it's okay, and uh, we can eventually slow it down. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. It's all. It's 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 all fine. It's just this video is a bit long. Um, yeah. So what I'm saying is, um, Napari has some nice visualization tools, which may for the cloud computing be not super um, uh, important, but I nevertheless wanted to show it here today. Um, that you know that drawing outlines around objects, these kind of things, it's all possible with some basic Python scripting skills. And again, I recommend notebooks to, to do this in a reproducible fashion. Um, you can also execute uh, export Jupyter notebooks, which do not use Napari anymore. And that might make a lot of sense. Um, and therefore, we implemented also a kind of important thing. You see here um, what I'm doing. I'm import some libraries, for example, PyClass Peranto is the GPU acceleration library I'm working on in the Python ecosystem, the CLIJ of Napari, you could say, um, and I'm loading a data set. And if you typically in Python, if you load a data set and then you print it out or you put in a Jupyter notebook, just a variable, you would read array and a couple of numbers. And this is very un, un, un user unfriendly, I would say. That's why we implemented this strategy that you can basically, um, when you put the variable in Jupyter notebook cell, you see the result image. Or here in this case, that's a three-dimensional image. And we see a maximum projection of that image. You also get a little histogram. So again, this is a bit the idea of getting the user feeling uh, we have from ImageJ to the Python ecosystem, that you can quickly see the minimum maximum distribution of your data set in a Jupyter notebook. Um, and you can subtract background. And you can also look at the background subtracted image directly in your Jupyter notebook. Um, and you can also segment nuclear, and you will also see it, this image visual, visualized like that. You can also then see, for example, here the maximum intensity in the label image corresponds to the number of labels in that image. So that is meant to be as user friendly as, as we can make it. Um, then this is also a nice tool called Stack View. It's basically some interactive um, going through slices of a data set or here even blending the original data set and the segmentation on top of each other and visualizing both um, in within the Jupyter notebook. That works very nicely on uh, my local machine. As you can see here, it also works nicely on the Kaput cluster of our university. Um, so it is a cloud thing, um, but unfortunately it does not work in Google Colab. And I'm not exactly sure if I will fix that. So it's like limitedly important for, for me and my work and for the work of my collaborators. Um, but anyway, some people may like it. Also, if you want to tune parameters, you can also do that with the same interface. There are some nice tools for that. If you, for example, uh, you have developed the workflow, but from data set to data set, um, parameters vary and you want to do some checks or you want to do some user input um, into that, you can use that tool. Um, again, works nicely in Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Lab, um, but not in Google Colab. And yeah, and then the question is, um, I think many people do not have a graphics card um, in their local laptop or in their local workstation. They also cost money. But on the one hand, Google Colabs cost, uh, is, is, is uh, free of charge. So you do not have to uh, buy anything. You can use a graphics card there for free. And for example, the Compute Center of the University of Technology here in Dresden is a national node of high performance computing for the life sciences. So basically everybody from a university in Germany and presumably also from other research institutes can apply there and get like compute time on this cluster and then log in, for example, to a Jupyter Hub um, and use this infrastructure. And there is uh, in Germany, in Europe, all over the place, there are institutes, research facilities, compute centers, which all have these kind of offers. Um, so you basically do not have to buy a graphics card anymore. You can do these things in the cloud, typically provided via Jupyter Hub. Um, so I will not show how to log into TU Dresden because I'm not sure if there's anybody from TU Dresden here at the call. Um, but I will quickly guide you through how to do these kind of things. Um, in Google Colab. And you could then also, when you download the slides later, you can click here on the link at the bottom and you can follow these steps. Um, the first thing you definitely need to do, you have to install the libraries you were using. So here in this case, we are using PyClass Peranto prototype. So you have to pip install it into your notebook. Um, then afterwards, you can again process, load a data set and visualize it like that. So this is again, this example I showed earlier, um, where you see small histogram, minimum, maximum intensity. It also tells you how large the image is you were just loading. And you can also segment 
execute segmentation workflows and visualize it the same way in the cloud. Again, without the need to buy a graphics card and or put a workstation in office, which mostly collects dust. Um, and just to summarize a bit, this kind of um, advertisement of Jupyter Notebooks, um, of Jupyter Lab. So of course, yes, you need some basic Python programming skills. There is no way around. It's also limited interactively. So I've shown that so you can go through some slides with some tools, you can visualize images, but you typically have a hard time when it comes to, I want to turn my sample in 3D like in Napari. So Napari is clearly outperforming kind of this um, infrastructure. But I also would like to highlight this increased reproducibility. So if I send in, if I upload an image chain macro to GitHub, um, it may or may not work on somebody else's computer. And in particular, um, people can from the code itself on github.com not exactly know what this script is doing. They really would have to read or ex even execute it. Um, but if you upload a Jupyter notebook, for example, as shown here on the right to GitHub, you can in the browser see what the intermediate results of these workflow are. So it's highly reproducible. It allows people to understand what's going on and do the same steps with their data also. And this is goes towards knowledge exchange, right? So you can such a notebook you can keep and you can have, and then you can go to a group meeting and your group leader, um, your PI may then ask you, look, how was this image segmented? And you can immediately show it in the Jupyter notebook and say, hey, look, this is how we determine the parameters and this is how the result looked like. You do not have to open ImageJ or open Napari and click a lot of buttons to come to that point where your group leader can eventually see what was happening. Um, also the other way around, right? Um, if, for example, a PhD student leaves the institute and leaves behind some notebooks, the next student can pick these notebooks up and learn from the person who is no longer there, how did they do their image analysis. So I presume technologies like notebooks um, will make our life easier in the future when it comes to knowledge transfer. Um, yeah, and again, you can submit these uh, notebooks, for example, to Google Colab and then execute the code there um, and run image analysis workflows in the cloud. And when it comes to batch processing, this question comes up again and again. Um, we have some nice batch processing tools in ImageJ, which allow you to process an entire folder and then write the results in another folder and some images and stuff. I think either nobody or only like very limited functionality of that kind will be in uh, will be available, for example, in Apari because. If you want to do batch processing, Python is the right thing to use and not Napari. So again, you should program a Jupyter Notebook or even better in this case, a Python script, which contains similar code like in your Jupyter Notebook and basically is then executed to process images on a folder. So it's like strongly recommended to do that, for example, with command line tools in Python scripts and not by clicking again and again the same workflow or in the user interface um, doing stuff interactively. It's like really supposed to be run in the background or even in the cloud. Um, so it's not that we have like exercise time in particular for this session here, but I thought the one or the other of you may want to try it out. Also, if you watch the video later on YouTube, you may be interested in replicating some of the things I was just mentioning. That's why I have here some exercises. You can do them whenever you like um, and also come back to me. I'm happy to help online if there is anything. So what I would recommend if you want to in Napari, um, click some workflows and then generate notebooks from that and run them in, for example, Google Colab or on your local institutional high performance computing infrastructure. Um, I would recommend downloading DevBio Napari. It's a collection of Napari plugins me and my team are developing. Um, it, it basically avoids the problem of you have to install a lot of plugins individually and spend half a day of installing things. This is like a one shot installation. The instructions are on the website. And if the instruction worked nicely, Napari, when you enter Naparia, it's not a typo, um, on the command line, it should approximately look like that. Um, and there's also a troubleshooting section, for example, guiding you to graphics cards drivers where you can download in case they are missing on your computer. Um, and with such, if, when the tool looks like that on your screen, you can then, for example, download this example data set, which is linked up here, and then open Napari again with Naparia from the command line. Um, and you can then click on remove background and label and then the result should look approximately like that. Um, and then you can generate code, for example, a Jupyter notebook. And you can execute this Jupyter notebook in your, on your local machine with JupyterLab. 
Um, or you can upload this notebook to Google Colab. And if you have very limited time, you can here click on this link, which will bring you to my version of this notebook online, um, where you can also modify a bit the parameters and play a bit with this notebook to run this image analysis in the cloud. Um, there's like also if you if you have never used Google Colab before, there's also a blog post on our blog where I explain a bit. This is how you log in. This is how you create a notebook. And this is how you access, uh, activate the access to the graphics card. And then you have to install Pike Esperanto, as I mentioned earlier. And then you can do image analysis processing. So this is here linked in this blog post. And if you really are eager into trying all the things out, I also can uh, guide you through tiled image processing. There's also some notebooks for that, um, where you basically you have a, a large image. It's in this case 2,000 times 5,000 pixels large, and we count some nuclei in this image. I think it's a histological slice, if I remember correctly. Um, and then we basically define our Python function for processing this workflow. It's basically copy-pasted effectively from a generated notebook. And then you can get a smaller image out where you for every tile see how many nuclei in this tile are. So it's a way of dealing with the big data problem by counting nuclei in tiles. And then every uh, tile becomes a pixel in a result image where you can see how many nuclei there are. Um, also, just a reminder uh, for those of you who don't know this platform yet, if you work with Napari and you wonder, is there a plugin, for example, for cell segmentation. You can enter cell segmentation on the Napari hub and it will give you a list of Napari plugins um, which allow you to do that. So it's also becomes more and more user friendly to enter, for example, biological terms and then actually get um, technology back um, uh, plugins which allow you to do that. So also feature extraction. Again, depending on what you want to do, enter that there in the search, term, in the search field and it will give you something useful, presumably. Um, if you have any questions um, regarding um, the notebooks I was sharing here, or also in very, very general image analysis, go to the image.sc forum, ask there. We are now at the point where there are so many experts online on that platform that you typically have an answer in the same day, pretty sure, sometimes in 20 minutes, depending on what kind of question you ask. So if you have never heard about the image science community or image.sc, um, go there, have a look. It's a very open, very friendly community where people just help typically within the same day. Um, cite what you use. So I showed you a couple of tools and they were also published earlier. So we are, we are publishing that in Nature Methods and uh, the cell neighborhood relationship stuff in frontiers in computer science. And also one more hint, um, you can typically or very often, you can also cite GitHub repositories, like source code, open source packages. So you see here Pike Esperanto, for example, has this Zenodo button on the website, uh, on the GitHub repository. So you see that here. Um, and when you then come to the Zenodo page where the code for specific versions is basically archived, you have to scroll down a bit and there's a section which says site as. So you can also cite software now, um, which is, for example, um, in Germany was recently discussed a big thing. Um, because if you apply to the German funding agency so far, you had to provide links to publications. And since recently, you can also provide links to open source libraries. <laughs> and if they were cited, right, it would make life easier. So again, um, please cite the tools we are developing for the community. And it allows us to enable long-term maintenance of tools through funding. Um, last but not least, there will be some workshops specifically for GPU accelerated image processing. I think in May in Paris uh, next year and in September in Dresden and London, we don't know yet. Um, but if you want to join one of those, it will be training school, new bias uh, style training schools about GPU acceleration, but I think also about basic image analysis. Um, if you want to know exactly when it will happen, reach out, drop me an email, and I'll put you on the list of interested people. Um, with that, I would like to thank you. I'm finishing a bit early, more time for questions. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for listening. And again, Rocco and the organizers, thanks for having me. All right, thanks, Rocco. Um, yeah, so my name is Beatriz Serrano. I'm, I'm community manager for the European Galaxy project. And I will present here uh, the different options uh, that image analysts have in Galaxy. Um, so I would like to start by introducing Galaxy and the Galaxy project a bit. Galaxy project is, is a worldwide open source project that aims um, at making computational support research 
um, reproducible, uh, transparent, and accessible for everyone. There are three main uh, continental servers, like you can see here, one in the US, another one in Europe. There is the one in Freiburg where we work, and the other one in Australia. Uh, there are more than 130 public servers as well that we are aware of. It's, it's a bit hard to track this design. Um, and there are also plenty of private servers in research institutes and, and, and industry as well. But again, this is also hard to know and, and give precise numbers about this. And the most important thing uh, is that there is a worldwide community of users, tool developers, and means and trainees that are scattered all over the globe. So what is, what is Galaxy? Um, so Galaxy is a web-based computational workbench uh, with a graphical user interface, like the one that you can see here in the screenshot, and also with a programmatic API for um, scripting, uh, scripting and, and automation. This is how it looks like in the browser. So it has uh, three main panels. You can see on the left side, uh, there is a, a set of tools. So in each one of these categories, you will, you will find different tools for different operations. There are more or less 8,000 tools available. So it's useful for way more than just imaging and, and data, analysis, data analysis in general and visualization. There is uh, the central panel, uh, this is the working area where the home page is now and, and there are uh, tool interfaces uh, are displayed. And on the right panel, there's a data sets and operations that are performed will, will appear in, in order of ex execution. So it's kind of a live documentation of the processing steps, similar to, to what you would have in, in a lab notebook. And how it looks um, in real life is something like this in this video. So this is specifically one um, imaging uh, sub subdomain or uh, flavor of Galaxy in which all the important tools or relevant tools for uh, image analysts uh, are gathered. So you see there, um, yeah, segmentation or data access, feature extraction, all the things that are now integrated into Galaxy. Um, we also have plenty of um, training materials as well with different options. Uh, you can see the workflows there, examples, um, different tools that I use, data sets, everything that is possible to, that you need to reproduce any of this analysis. Okay, so what I want to talk about is what is it that is useful for image analysis here in Galaxy and what can Galaxy offer to this community. In the first place I wanted to, to talk about the data access. So there are different uh, plugin systems so that users can get the data from remote locations like you see in the screenshot. You can get um, uh, the data from your S3 bucket, from FTP and many other different protocols. So that's also something that Galaxy provides, but also that can be extended if there is something that is not covered yet there. It should be uh, extendable by um, uh, adding these plugins there. This is an example of one tool that we were using in the past in the context of um, EOS Live and thanks to the uh, COVID project as well, that was to get the data from the image data source. Um, that was, um, yeah, so just to get the data into Galaxy, the all the data that we need to perform an analysis and not to transfer the whole thing. So one can get select what, you, what where do you want to get data from? So if it's public, from the IDR, if it's private, you can also get it from a local, local Omero instance. And then, uh, of course, you need your credentials for that. But if you have some uh, local installation of Omero, that's possible as well. Uh, then one can select what the uh, image ID is or what is the images that you want to download. Um, and finally, define the region of interest. So uh, that was very useful in particular for several projects that we were working on because um, transferring the data, it's, it's uh, time consuming and resource consuming. So taking only the channels that are relevant, only the planes, uh, the, the cropping the image, that's also um, something that was interesting for us. Okay, so in terms of imaging tools, there are plenty of things. I'm sure that this list is not comprehensive and that's something that I think should be um, better um, organized, like having all the resources together. I try to collect all of them, but I'm sure uh, that there's more that I'm not aware of. Uh, there are different disciplines there. You've seen already the data access ones that are for segmentation in particular and feature extraction. We were working with Cell Profiler, but there is also something on image as well. Um, so all of that you can find in this galaxy.eu. Um, yeah, please take a look at this. Um, what we, or I guess the main message here is to say that you can integrate those tools. So if you are a tool developer, you can also integrate those tools into Galaxy so that people can 
put them together together with other tools to create a workflow that perform a particular type of analysis. And I think what is interesting about Galaxy in that case and why it can be very useful also for cross-discipline cross analysis is that there are tools and many different disciplines that are already using Galaxy to, to do their research. So this the combination of these um, different disciplines can allow also uh, for new reproducible analysis that combine uh, several areas of science. And finally, um, Robert already mentioned a bit of that. So that it's possible to have um, notebooks as well in Galaxy. So you have the interactive tools there in lifeisgalaxy.eu. And especially I wanted to highlight I think the three that are, I think are more interesting for image analytics. So you can use Jupyter notebooks, R Studio as well as an interactive environment, and also virtual desktops. And this will be also tracked in your history. So on the panel on the right that I showed before, this will be just an extra step on that. And that sometimes is useful either for pre-processing something before you start your actual image analysis or at the end to analyze the features and, and the outcomes of, of the analysis in Galaxy. So in terms of workflow, I wanted to mention a project that I was working in a previous life uh, within in my postdoc within EUS life. And we wanted to analyze the nucleus biology. So basically we have images like this one, they were, they were all public, deposited in the IDR. And the, the holes there, there is the, the lack of uh, staining. So basically uh, when there is no DNA in, those, in that particular channel, we were gathering these kind of images for different screens, uh, gene silences, overexpression and compounds. In total, we got uh, around 200,000 images that we wanted to analyze and get in general some insights into um, how the nucleoli works. Um, more specifically, we want to pay attention to features like how many nucleoli we would find per nucleus, if the shape would change when a, a specific gene is inhibited or expressed or an, a compound is acting on it. Also see if uh, they distribute differently within the nucleus. So all these kinds of things were interesting for us and we wanted to use Galaxy for this. So we develop a pipeline like this one, in which first we will have the IDR download tool that I showed before, that was already part of Galaxy. Um, that was just to get the data access. So first we would filter all the images that were interesting for our particular uh, problem. And then um, uh, my colleagues at EMBO um, in integrated several tools uh, from cell profile, several models of cell profile into Galaxy tools. And that's the one that we changed to create this automated workflow so we could run in these 200,000 images. And finally, we could use uh, um, interactive notebooks to analyze the features that we were deriving from this analysis. And this is how an, a, a normal um, workflow looks in Galaxy. So each one of these uh, boxes there is a different tool. So you can see that this um, starting models of cell profile then it goes to color to gray. So different transformations on the image and the whole thing creates a workflow here. Um, we deposited these um, different workflows in, in the workflow hub and it's available for everybody that wants to use it. We also have tutorials on that. I will talk about this a bit more later. So in the end, one, one only needs to put together all these different tools, create the workflow with the, with the um, operations that you want to perform and click on and run uh, and that's it. And now uh, from the workflow hub, you can also directly explore the different uh, work, uh, Galaxy workflows there and run on galaxy.eu directly. So it's even easier. All right, so on terms of computation, um, yeah, so there are public services that I mentioned already, so it's completely free. You just need to create an account, you log in, and then you can use the infrastructure. Everybody's welcome. It's not just for Europe, US, or Australia. Everyone in the world can use that for free. And the, user the, the interface is user-friendly. You've seen that you only need to click and plug things together, and that's it. So the, uh, the computation behind that is completely transparent to the user. If you don't need to deal with any commands or anything that is especially more technical. However, if you still want to do that because you want to automate something or do some uh, particular operations that, I don't know, that are, or parallelizes something that it's more um, the technical side, there is also an API that allows you to do the same operations that you can do with the graphical user interface, but just with command line. Um, I, I would like to highlight also here on the computational side that the interoperability and flexibility are great features that Galaxy can provide to image analysts because 
you can combine their different softwares and, and have all these tools in the same workflow. Maybe something is interesting for you to do with their profiler, but the outcome could be better processed with image A. And then you need to have some machine learning on top that you can also have to, uh, those tools in Galaxy and plug them together and then analyze finally something because you have a very particular um, uh, code that you want to run on something very specific. And then you have an interactive notebook that you can also plug to the whole thing. And the whole analysis could be reproducible and reusable by others. You can share it. It's shared in a transparent way. You can share it publicly. You can attach it to your publication. All of that is possible. And also it's scale. So um, that's something that in the workflow that I showed before was the main point, right? It's, it's insane to run 200,000 images. You cannot visually inspect. You cannot do that much because it's a huge data set. So scaling that um, was also important for us. And there is also the option to have a distributed computing. So there is a pool and network in Galaxy in which you can submit a job to a particular server, but that might not run in that one, but can run in another one. And this is particularly useful when, for instance, there is a particular software, um, sorry, hardware that is in a, in a specific instance. For instance, if there is GPUs in one of them and this is what you need, you could submit the job to a different server as well. Yeah, so the user support side, um, it's also interesting for, I think, uh, image, imaging facilities and, and institutes in general that want to have their own Galaxy instance running because users, when they find a problem, they can submit a bad report that looks like this one. The user can input the um, information, describing a bit the problem, but the admin uh, that is on the other side can receive all these things together with all the details about how the problem happened. So what was the tool that was running? What is the job, the job that was um, in the cluster running? What is the version? Everything that is necessary to reproduce that and also the uh, um, uh, standard output, standard error and everything that can help the admin to, to debug and understand what the problem was. And the good thing about that is also that it's centralized so that you don't need several people helping in different places. So everything that is happening around the particular uh, Galaxy server, you can get in the centralized way and, and help people um, scaling up in, more, in a more easy way. Um, finally, on data deposition, so this is something that I came across recently. Um, Bugra from um, Yoruba Imaging is working on the OMSR format uh, integration into Galaxy. So OMSR is a standard image format. You can see here an example um, of a visualization of a huge... That is something to work on. <laughs> Um, so one can see these um, images that are huge and can inspect them, rotate, uh, perform some operations on that. And even when they are so big, it, it still works fine. Um, the, that's because it's, it's chunks to the data. It's also multi-scale and the parameter model so that you can bring all the data that, that you're visualizing. It's a native cloud uh, compatible uh, file format. And as I said, it's, it's uh, fast enough contains also uh, the binary data that is produced by the microscope, but also the metadata associated to it. So what Bukla is doing is creating Galaxy tools that are first converting um, proprietary for file formats and, and data that you have in your local storage and or from the bioimage archive and converting them into OMSR uh, files. And this is uh, the tool in Galaxy on the right side. You can see that first you can input the data that you want and then the parameters that describe how this OMSR file will look like in the end, so how many chunks you will have and so on. Um, and then there is another tool for data submission to that. So once you create, maybe at the end of your analysis, uh, this OMSR um, uh, file, then you can uh, submit that to um, the BioImage Archive through uh, FTP pro, uh, protocol or Raspberry as well. And these two tools can create this kind of small uh, workflow where you have first the transformation and then the submission of data. But I mean, it, it, it can be also plugging any other moments, uh, points in your, in your workflow. It doesn't have to be at the end, could be also at the beginning, the input files and so on. So the final pipeline will look something like that. So there will be the image acquired from uh, the microscope, then it gets converted into OMSR so that everything is standard. It brings also the metadata, so that's also 
useful. And then uh, one can run the analysis that could be in Galaxy, and one can deposit the data finally in the Biomich archive, or even before if the raw data is what you want to submit. Yeah, so I mentioned already some training uh, on this, and that's something that you can do as Hadesh Society if you like. In Galaxy, there's a Galaxy Training Network where you have plenty of tutorials about plenty of different topics. And uh, part of this project that we were working on, um, we developed these um, different tutorials on using a profiler for the nucleolized segmentation. That was the original one, create something on nucleolized segmentation. Um, you have slides there if you want to run a, a workshop as well, hands on material, the workflow that, so you can reproduce it. Um, and you can run this in different instances as well. Uh, also, developing those tutorials is really not complicated, so anyone can, can do this. Um, we also developed one. So once we started with the first project, we realized that just with a few more tools, we could also have other examples like the tracking uh, one that you can see here. This is an example from the cell profiler uh, example, examples in the website. And we also developed a tutorial on this that you can follow step by step. So you can either assemble the whole workflow yourself, taking each one of the tools, putting them together and trying to uh, reproduce the whole thing or you can download directly the workflow that we provided and try to find yourself um, this data or some of the data that, that you might think is useful for you. Uh, finally, I wanted to, to mention a few interesting resources that could be useful for, for image analysis and for, in general, anyone that is working with Galaxy. So we have uh, training infrastructure as a service. This is a special queue for for trainers, so the trainers apply and get this special queue in the cluster so that when people join those, so the trainees are joining the, that course, they get special access to those resources. So that means that they don't need to wait in the general queue. They just uh, run everything directly and everything should run smoothly because yeah, they have this, this kind of priority. We have plenty of events on that and many people are asking for the resources. We have already more than 14,000 students uh, that have been using this service. So um, it's, quite, it's quite useful as well. The other thing that I wanted to mention was the Galaxy Mentor, which is rather new, but I wanted to briefly mention that um, this is a program that we run um, um, since uh, yeah, not so, so long ago. Um, people can apply there as a mentee or as a mentor, depending on your expertise and what you want to learn. And we have a program that lasts for eight weeks. So first we make the matches between the people with different interests and, and then the, the program starts for eight weeks. You can also, um, you have also the link there to join if you like, uh, yeah, as a mentee or as a mentor, it depends on what you like to do. And this is in general to onboard people in Galaxy or for people that are inside Galaxy already and within the community want to learn something completely different. I don't know, maybe you want to, to know how to develop a tutorial, maybe someone can help you with that. Um, yeah, many uh, resources are like this. And I think that's, uh, that's more or less it from my side. I wanted to have a final um, advertisement kind of. So I see many resources, many people interested in, in working with uh, imaging on Galaxy, but those, those efforts are, are often um, scattered. There's no much coordination on that. So I created this Google form and I'm gathering interest to see if people want to discuss more about these things and see what's available, try to somehow coordinate those efforts, uh, avoid the duplication of, of work basically. So if you're interested and, or you know someone that could be interested in having yeah, some discussions on that contributed with whatever you think you can, might be brainstorming, might be um, integrating tools, developing tutorials, anything that you could think of, uh, please click on that and, and join. Um, I, I will uh, try to coordinate that and communicate with these people with uh, next steps on that. Uh, you can also contact me in social networks and so on on my email and i will try to to help you if, if possible and i think that's it Rocco. i don't know if i took too long or too short but anyway i'm happy to take questions and, and bjorn is also online so he can also maybe help with that okay. <laughs> thank you very much uh thank you beatrice so uh i will start with uh, some specific question you mentioned that um image tool are available however 
a user may require a specific version of the software. I'm thinking about Fiji or a specific package. Um, it's possible on user side to install packages, like if you were working in a Conda environment before you run your uh, Jupyter notebook, or this is something that has to be done by administrator uh, upon request. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be through the admin. So also because of safety reasons, right? So you can understand everything every time. So you need to, to check that the tools are, are okay. Um, so it needs to be requested first. Then the tool needs to be a conda package, and then it has to be integrated into Galaxy. So that's so it's compatible with the ecosystem. And then um, you need to. It, it goes to into the into the tool shed that is like the app store of all the Galaxy tools. And the admin is the one that needs to install that. Can be the admin of a public server. You can also ask for that. I can be also a private. Um, if it's in your institute, you just talk to the admin of your Galaxy instance. Is that correct, Pjorn? Pjorn is admin. Um, yes. If if that was yes, this is the general answer to Galaxy tools. If you were asking. Um, if you can install tools in a notebook, I mean, this you can obviously do. So as as soon as you are in a notebook, you are in an encapsulated environment and you can install whatever you like, right? You, you can use all the corner magic that Robert has explained and install your, your environment as you like in the notebook. 